Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our, attending the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion's um, Autism Acceptance Month presentation. I am Damika Withers. I am the Chief Economic Equity and Inclusion Officer for Franklin County Board of Commissioners in the Office of Diversity, Equity, and, and Inclusion. April is Autism Acceptance Month. The National Autism Association reports one in 44 children are affected by autism and also suffer from other disabilities such as asthma, ADHD, bipolar disorder, sensory integration dysfunction, uh, health, health disparities as well as it relates to uh, allergies and other health conditions. We have an important conversation to talk to you um, today because as long as, as we are talking about um, those who are affected with autism and also affected with other visible and invisible um, disabilities, there are also disparities that already exist as it relates to access to healthcare, access to resources and education. I wanna thank our Board of Commissioners, um, Commissioner Crawley, President Commissioner Crawley, Commissioner O'Grady and Commissioner Boyce for acknowledging and making sure that they are putting these important conversations to the forefront and also our County Administrator, Kenneth Wilson. I have the great pleasure of an introducing you to our great panelists today, Dr. Jacqueline Nguyen, who is the Psychology Director from Nationwide Children's Hospital Center for Autism Spectrum Dis Disorders, Jenny Bryan, our resource specialist at Autism Society of Central Ohio, and Kathy Mackley, who is a director and here with us also from Autism Society of Central Ohio, and Gwendolyn Harsha, our program director at the Ohio Center for Autism and Low Incidents. Thank you for being here. And I also wanna thank our Franklin County Board of Developmental Disabilities for connecting us with our esteemed panelists today. Our Leandra Chakuros, our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Program Administrator, will facilitate our conversation today with our panelists. And I'm gonna turn it over now to Leandra. Good afternoon, and thank you so much, Damika. Oh, yeah, I could please grant the opportunity to allow our guest speakers to introduce themselves and provide additional contact information before we get started on our questions. Um, if you would like, Ms. Kathy, could you please go first? Sure. I'm going to just put a few slides up on the screen. Uh, I am the Managing Director of Autism Society Central Ohio. Uh, I am joined by our Information and Referral Specialist, Ginny Bryan. And we've just put together a few slides to tell, tell you about Autism Society Central Ohio and what we provide for uh, families and individuals affected by autism in 12 counties in central Ohio. So. Hey everyone, like Kathy said, my name is Ginny Bryan. I'm the resource specialist for the Autism Society Central Ohio. We have a brand new um, logo, some new branding, a new vision and a new mission statement. But most importantly, we want everyone to know we are the same organization. Our mission is to create connections, empowering everyone in the autism community with resources needed to live fully. So a great part of my job is to talk to families, whether it's um, on the phone, email, I do all the information and referral. And please, if you have a question, whether big or small, please reach out to us. We'd love to talk to you. Kathy and I always say, we don't have all the answers, but we will work really hard to find someone who can help you or direct you in the right way. Our vision is creating a world where everyone in the autism community is connected to do the supports they need when they need it. And so in addition to information and referral, we provide advocacy, and that may be guiding people through uh, meetings, through all the paperwork that goes with uh, getting an autism diagnosis, uh, talking to state legislators about uh, new laws and regulations, et cetera. Um, we create social connections uh, for families by uh, providing events and meet opportunities to meet other people who are walking the same uh, journey. We have support groups, both for uh, adults on the autism spectrum and parents of those 
uh, you know, affected by autism? We really feel that a big issue that our families face is isolation. So we love to create opportunities for them to come out into the community, to meet one another, to know they're not alone, and to have that family time together um, doing really fun things. Like, for example, you can see one of our slides is um, over at, at one of the indoor trampoline parks. Um, so we just love to create those type of opportunities for our families. And in addition to creating the connections between families, uh, these are also opportunities for children and uh, others with autism uh, to practice skills that they can use uh, in similar situations out in the community at large. And so, you know, that's part, you know, one of our real education and inclusion uh, opportunities. Uh, we offer a sensitive Santa every year in the hopes that uh, eventually they won't need our Santa, they'll be going to the Santa at the mall or the zoo. Um, so. And we'd love to also um, work on some well being for our families as well as for um, those on the spectrum. We offer a, well, I should say we did before COVID and we're hoping to bring it back. We have a caregiver restorative um, where our caregivers can come and just have a little time to themselves as well as some yoga for individuals on the spectrum or anyone with any disability. All of our programs are open to anyone. As Kathy and I say, you do not need a diagnosis card to uh, participate in anything we offer. Everyone is always welcome. But we have a wonderful program called Together in Motion. Um, that we like to uh, provide individuals with tools to learn yoga. We also provide them with a yoga mat so they can do it at home. So it's kind of lifelong learning on um, those type of skills. Right. And, and here, and are some oh, go ahead, Kathy. We just have an em emphasis on having fun together. Um, and you know, one of our new initiatives with uh, Gwen Harshaw is uh, we're developing uh, open mic afternoons for folks uh, with disabilities to come and practice their skills at music, uh, stand-up comedy, whatever. So that's called Band Together and uh, be watching for information about that if you have a, someone who'd like to share their talents. And the last thing I have is sort of, um, this is a high school student uh, at Delaware Career Center created this little video uh, for us. She herself has autism. Her name is Nina Fraze. It was made right before the CD, CDC upgraded the numbers. So um, it says one in 54, the numbers are now one in 44. But I love this because it is a high school student with autism uh, telling what she thinks is important for people to know. Autism, a developmental disability and neurological difference. It affects the individual's behavior communication, problem solving, thinking, and even learning. Approximately one in 54 children are diagnosed with autism. Most likely, the rates are higher than that. Undiagnosed cases are a problem, and if not addressed, can harm the individual. Don't wait to get your child diagnosed. We can help. Here at Autism Society Central Ohio, we host autism friendly events and offer advocacy, education, support, information, and referral. We also provide grants and assistance for families and their loved ones with autism. You can join our mission to ensure that everyone affected by autism in Central Ohio has the support they need when they need it. Donate through our website, volunteer, or join us at our annual Turkey Trot. Join the Autism Society in building a better world for autism. So I think she said it better than we could say it. Um, so thank you so much. Um, we'll be here to answer questions uh, and I will turn this over. Um, Back over to Leandra. Thank you so much. That was such a wonderful video. Ms. Quinn, would you like to go ahead and share your resources? Absolutely. Give me one moment to get set up. 
Is everyone seeing the screen? <laughs> okay. Yes. Well, my name is Gwen Harshaw and I am a program director with Ocali. I'm actually the program director for the Family and Community Outreach Center. And I'm very happy to be here and I'm um, very gratified to actually be part of Ocali because before I worked here, I was a parent and I have a son who's 26 years old at this time who had autism and Ocali and the Autism Society of Central Ohio were very helpful in our journey. So I'm very grateful for that. But I just wanna give you a quick overview of Ocali and what we offer. Um, basic, and the name Ocali stands for the Ohio Center for Autism and Low Incidence, which is basically a complicated name to say we serve families with disabilities across the board. And part of that reason is our vision which is that people with disabilities should have the opportunity to live their best lives. And because of that, our mission is that Ocali inspires change and promotes access to opportunities for people with disabilities. And we do that by informing public policy and developing practices grounded in linking research to real life. We do this also by consulting and very importantly, collaborating with many different partners across the state, including state agencies, school districts, community pro programs, county boards, and of course, families. And ultimately, we are kind of a clearinghouse for information and resources that we um, utilize evidence-based strategies to assist those who care for and support people with disabilities. And this, of course, includes educators, professionals, and families. We do this through um, our various centers and resources. We have actually 10 different centers that we all focus on different aspects, but we also partner and we try to come up with novel and new ideas to serve that. Um, one of the things I'm really excited to talk about is OcaliCon, which is the premier autism and networking conference. We have it once a year, it's always in November. And it's, it's just a wonderful opportunity to network, to learn. And my really exciting announcement is that if you register early between April 18th and the end of April, you can register for OcaliCon for free. So you just need to go to the website, www.ocalicon.org and register. And hopefully we'll see you in November. The other thing I'm really excited about, Kathy touched on, because we're partnering, Ocali's partnering with ASCO, the Autism Society of Central Ohio, to put together Band Together. Band Together Columbus, or actually no, it's been renamed Band Together Central Ohio, and it's going to be a monthly autism and disability friendly open mic. And the purpose really in the mission is socialization. We, we're utilizing music, but it doesn't have to be limited to music. We wanna create a friendly and open environment for individuals with autism and disabilities can come and express their interests and express their talents. Um, we're loosely based on an organization called Band Together in Pittsburgh. They've been going for almost five years and it's been a rousing success. It's going to be located in a really nice venue in Gahanna, and it starts in August, August 14th, I believe. It'll be the second Sunday of every month. You keep a lookout. You'll start hearing about it in May, and we would love to see you there. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of overview. Um, like I said, we have so many online resources. Go to ocali.org. We have webinars. We have courses the conference, obviously, and different programs. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter, Ocali Now, and we are also available on almost all social um, platforms. So take a look on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and even LinkedIn. So we'd love to see you there. So this is my contact information, basically my name, Gwen Harshaw at Ocali.org, or just go to our website, Ocali.org, and I think you'll be very pleased with the information there. So thank you. Thank you so very much. I greatly appreciate that. Ms. Jackie, would you like to say some words? Hi, everybody. Um, it's so nice to be here. And I'm so, um, I'm really honored to be um, especially included from the Franklin County Board of Commissioners because I know the commitment to kids and um, to getting all kids um, the services and supports that they need. So we really, um, I'm really happy to, to be here. So I just have um, a little visual to show um, where I'm from and um, what, um, what, we, what we do at um, Children's Hospital, um, if that's okay to share. 
Uh, let's see. Looks like maybe I can't share. But that's okay. Maybe I can, I'll just tell you about it then. Um, oh, I can share. Um, so we, um, I'm from the Nationwide Children's Hospital uh, Center for Autism Spectrum Disorders. Um, and we're here in Columbus. Um, and we are really the hub of autism, uh, mostly psychological services. So our hospital also has therapy services from our speech pathology program and, um, and um, you know, other, other medical services, but our center, the center that I direct, um, is really providing behavioral supports to um, children with, and youth with autism from birth all the way through 22. And we organize our services in a, in a few different ways. Um, we do community outreach. Um, we have a core set of services um, called our Behavioral Intervention Program. Um, we do specialized psychotherapy services when kids also have mental health concerns and can, um, um, you know, typically can engage in a psychotherapy um, service uh, verbally. Um, we also have a special program for kids who are really having a lot of trouble with emotional regulation and maybe having um, some behavioral escalation um, situations. So where we really need to help um, provide some coping skills, help the family feel safe and the child feel safe. Um, and then we, all of this is supported by our autism resource clinicians who really help families uh, enter our system, learn about systems like the ones mentioned from Ocali and Autism Society out in the community, um, help connect to their school system, um, other funding resources. So those clinicians kind of help support our four um, uh, areas of focus. And then we work really in, closely in conjunction with our psychiatry department and then our child development center. Um, and so I'll just show you um, I'm not one more slide just about um, that kind of gives a little bit of visual about the kinds of care we do. We have about 150 staff members, um, um, faculty and staff. Um, we're serving about 1,800 to 2,000 kids a year. And this is separate from our diagnostic program where we have about 40 um, psychologists that are specifically dedicated to developmental assessments. Um, and they're serving thousands of families a year as well. Even with all those resources that we've put together to help kids in the community um, who are autistic and their families, we still have um, wait times, we still have access issues. So like this is a very high need area um, and is identified as um, really an area to grow and continue to focus on from our hospital's perspective. Um, in addition to the support that they really are trying to put forward in terms of behavioral health for all kids um, suffering from some mental health conditions. But even with all of that effort, expertise, number of people, we still have a lot, lot more to do. One of the things that we've tried to do is really find a service that could fit any family's need um, and any child's need. So um, we started with intensive interventions, but we've really added um, so many other forms of care. So we're working individually with parents. We have group parent training and parent support opportunities. We're working in the schools. We're working with adolescents who are needing to like move toward adulthood. We're working with the families to prepare for um, adulthood and to understand all the procedural things they might need to learn. We're offering free employment opportunities. And again, with our kids who can benefit from psychotherapy, we have it specifically oriented toward the kinds of needs a, an autistic youth might need, have. Um, but we do that with groups and parent groups and individual um, sessions and some school supports. And then for kids who are really having those most severe concerns and, and really getting into some dangerous situations um, when they are upset, we have a form of day treatment where kids can come in every day into a safe treatment space where people understand, you know, kids can be upset if they need to be and work through it, but we can really help them day by day build some coping skills and help the family understand how to reduce triggers and to really make the, the pathway through life you know, a little bit easier um, when, that, um, when those difficulties arise. And then for our outreach, um, we have summer, we have uh, three different kinds of summer camps that run all summer. We do sibling support programs. Um, we do some low cost educational programs. So anyway, we've tried to fill like so many different areas of, of service need as much as we possibly can. But um, we are so lucky to have the support and all the 
additional and amazing services that Ocali has um, developed and resources. Um, we've definitely um, partnered with Ocali in a number of ways. I'm on the board at um, the advisory board at Ocali. So, so much positive to say about um, Gwen's work and everything there. And the Autism Society um, of America and the Columbus um, group, what, you know, the foundational work that the Autism Society has done to help families um, have resources to connect with each other, to support kids in, and youth in the community um, who have autism, just amazing. So anyway, I'm really excited to be here. This is my contact info. Um, again, simple, my name, Jackie.win and at nationwidechildrens.org. Um, you can also look on our website as well and try and um, connect. I'm really happy to try and if anyone has had trouble in our system or needs to find their path in our system, I'm certainly happy to like um, to talk individually with anyone who needs that kind of um, next step guidance. Thank you so very much. That was absolutely wonderful. We do have a few questions, so I'd love to jump right in if we could. Um, the first one, many of us have heard about autism and the spectrum, but there could be a few that don't truly have an understanding of what that means. Are there any indicators of autism we should be aware of? And are there any misconceptions surrounding autism that you often hear? Well, uh, but yes to both. Uh, um, there, you know, uh, a lot of, lot of I, yeah, I will defer to Dr. Wynn on the indicators of autism, um, but I think there are lots of misconceptions um, one that, that uh, autism is necessarily an intellectual disability. Um, approximately 50% of people with autism test with normal IQs or better. Uh, the testing is, is often verbal and may not be um, able to detect what the actual cognitive abilities of someone with autism are. Um, that people with autism don't have emotions. That's another uh, myth. Um, that they, uh, their emotions may be expressed differently. They may have emotional reactions to things that we uh, don't normally have emotional reactions. But um, you know, they they're able to love you know to love people and express that love. Um, when my son was diagnosed 25 years ago, it was basic. I was told they have no emotions, uh, and of course, you know, I knew my child, and I knew that wasn't true. Um, you know, not, you know, there are lots and lots of folks out there living very full lives uh, with autism. It is not um, a, a sentence to a, a, you know, a bad quality of life. Um. Um, Leander, I'll say a couple more things kind of from the diagnostic process, I think. So a lot of kids come in, um, you know, early on. So say younger kids where parents are concerned. Sometimes they're not even getting to us because the signs might not be all that obvious. So that, you know, somebody might be saying, oh, don't worry, um, maybe he's just shy or maybe he's, just, he's gonna talk, but it'll just come a little bit later. Um, and so those are some of the early signs we do look for um, and that we would suggest kids come in for a screening appointment, you know, when, when the language um, isn't developing kind of as you'd expect, maybe gaining some words then losing them or kind of repeating words, but not, not maybe developing, you know, the um, the language abilities, the the way of this, the sibling ha might have, um, but also some of the the social behaviors, the really kind of early, you know, baby infant um, social behaviors you might look for, just some of that eye contact that you'd have, especially kind of caregiver to child, and and really the way that starts to get more and more complicated as kids age, so having eye contact and then following gestures and learning about the environment through this through this engagement. Some of that might be something that you'd see that um, maybe no one ever taught you about before. You know, we don't really talk about some of the social developmental norms that we should be looking for in our little babies. Um, so those two things often are the things that families are concerned about. And maybe also just, you know, how many, like the number of um, situations of, of upset or tantrums. And again, probably each one of those things could be dismissed. And so a parent really having a gut feeling that you should really take that gut feeling and move forward and push, push to get the kind of um, evaluation from, from somebody who's had work in developmental assessment. I think the, um, 
The other things that can happen are like for maybe older kids who um, are coming in for assessment where it's really been less clear. Maybe language has developed just fine, you know, like um, Kathy was saying, you know, half of kids who are autistic, the intellectual or language impairment is not a part of that profile. So then you're really looking for these patterns of behavior. Well, maybe he really loves to do this thing over and over again. What's wrong with that? So that, you know, maybe it takes a while to realize, oh, it's kind of isolating him. And maybe that's causing some difficulty with peer relationships at school or something like that. So as the kids get older, again, pushing through your questions and maybe people dismissing some of those concerns. And then I'd say the third track is maybe if there are some other things that um, could, could be diagnosed as other mental health conditions. So kids who have ADHD or anxiety or maybe obsessive compulsive disorder or just some behavior problems, that might be the first thing people see. Well, gosh, he's always so active. But what, if they're not asking all the additional questions, he also has having trouble with friendships. And, oh, he's so kind of, kind of a needing, like compulsively needing to have things a certain way. Well, that's different than ADHD. And that the core of that might be, for that child might be something different than ADHD, but it might take a while to tease through it and for people to really identify those things. So I'd say, if you have, a, if you have an intuition that there's something that's not quite right or explained, keep at it. Because it can be hard for the diagnosers, you know, to really gather the right information, but also sometimes uh, there's inappropriate dismissive, dismissiveness about a parent's concern. Thank you so much. That is so insightful and very, very helpful. That actually leads into my next question, which is wonderful. Once a diagnosis has been reached, it can be very overwhelming and scary to determine what to do next. Um, so if you could please discuss initial steps to take when a child and adult loved one has been recently diagnosed. Well, well I, I, uh, go ahead. Okay, I, I was just gonna say the first step uh, I think is to, you know, for a child, someone under tw age 22 is to contact your local board of developmental disabilities and get into their system uh, because there are a lot of supports and funding uh, and, and resources that are available through that system. Um, and then the second one uh, I would say is to call Ocali or Ginny at Autism Society or, you know, some other, you know, nationwide uh, to, to start uh, getting on, you know, finding out what, the, what is available out there and getting on the waiting lists and, and uh, moving ahead. Um, children who are three and older uh, can receive uh, services and diagnosis and, and through, through their uh, school district of residence, uh, another place to call. I also think it's important for the parents to have their own supports. And I like to sometimes call it their own tribe, whether it be a support group or a group of parents that you've identified maybe in your child's class. Um, just it's, it's great to have that. So you all kind of understand your journeys are not going to be identical by any means, but you get it. You, you get the understanding. You can celebrate together. You can, you can talk about what resources are working or what resources are out there. So I think that parent support is also a huge component that can be extremely helpful to the families. I always say I was saved by a support group. When my son was diagnosed, I, uh, you know, 27 years ago, all that there was in town was the Autism Society monthly support group. And I went there and I met parents with, who had older children who were, uh, had been through the school process, had been, been through uh, the process of finding an occupational therapist. And uh, those are still some of my um, fondest memories, I think. I agree. And actually both of your answers are kind of intertwined because how do you find a support group? Look to those organizations like ASCO, the Autism Society of Central Ohio, you will meet other parents. And that way, because sometimes you need someone in your tribe who is in the situation to to completely understand. That doesn't mean your other family and friends can't be a support, but there, it, that, that's priceless to have that. And my other word I always give to parents, particularly ones with a new um, diagnosis is persevere and know <laughs> your importance. I mean, it, I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's, um, it can be amazing. And you can meet amazing people 
and to discover that. And I know that you're the expert, particularly a parent of a young child. You're the expert, even more so than the doctors. I mean, they are priceless and we need them. But, and if you get dismissed, persevere, come back. I mean, I wish I had a better answer for that, but if you're, if you're seeing signs that they're not developing in the way that you think and you kind of get dismissed, because that was what happened to us. We had our son and our son was an only child at the time and they, he was slow to talk and they were like, well, he's an only child, he's a boy. And I mean, and maybe that's sometimes true. But if three months go by, certainly if six months go by and you still have that concern in your gut, ask again and keep asking. So the one thing I'd add is just like, know that it's a journey. And, um, you know, like, I think like Jenny said, everyone's journey is going to be different, but mm -hmm. taking the opportunity to like, to, to learn, to, to figure out what your priorities are, what you think your family's priorities are because there are treatment modalities out there that can help the particular issues that you might be facing. I mean, you might need no treatment, but, um, but if you do need treatment, there are things out there that can help and support. And so taking your time to learn about them. Um, we talk about early intervention, but early intervention is a fairly long window. It doesn't mean that the next day things need to start. I mean, kids' brains are malleable like through the teenage years, you know, so all of these interventions we have, we'd like to start early, but if you're not ready or if it's not available or if you're moving from one format to another, all of those things, that path is okay. Just, you know, um, taking the opportunity to learn about the different options and and finding out more if you if you feel like you don't understand fully and using your using other parents because um, other parents' um, knowledge base support is just, is critical. Thank you very much, thank you. Now we know caring for autism or someone with autism, pardon me, can be very demanding. Can we discuss services available for caregivers? What type of supports are in place for families that care for children and adults even with autism? There are actually quite a few organizations. Ocali, we're definitely dedicated to that. We partner with a lot of organizations. Um, we start out with just information. Um, we're a clearinghouse of information. Um, there is a ton of information just on our website and it's free. Um, you might want to bring a cup of coffee and take your time because there's so much of it, but it's so valuable. And like I said earlier, I'm so gratified to be working on this side because all all three of these organizations that are represented helped me with my journey with my son, Children's Hospital, the Autism Society, and of course, Ocali. But I had no idea how many, how much is out there working feverishly to, to answer these questions and serve these families. And um, for example, Ocali works very closely with the Family Engagement Center at Ohio State University. And they partner with a lot of teachers and educators to work on family engagement. And that means um, just unification between the administrators, the educators and families and parents and the school level. And who knew? <laughs> I didn't. And I mean, there's so much going on. You, you probably wanna try and reach out and look and research, but there's a lot out there to help people. And I would um, point out to one more Ocali resource that I think is invaluable. And that is Autism Strategies uh, in Action, in action yeah. yes. uh, which is a, yep. it is a free uh, three video, video uh, online modules for preschool, school age, and transition age. Uh, and, and it is teaching about autism, about strategies that may help with autism. Uh, I have been certified in two of those modules, and I... I will say I didn't learn a whole lot that was new, but I'd already had 25 years of in the trenches training. Uh, if I had had that video right at diagnosis, uh, it would have saved my son, my family, uh, my husband and myself a lot of grief and a lot of trial and error uh, because, because you know, knowing how to respond to something and understanding the origins of something connected to, to autism um, it makes your whole life easier because you are not spinning on that hamster wheel. 
So I, you know, I think that's one of the most important resources out here for res res residents of Ohio. And I thank Ocali for doing that one. Thank you, Kathy. You're right. ASD strategies in action, and it's real life, and you learn so much, and you can apply it at home or in school. It's wonderful. So thank right. you for reminding me. <laughs> and, and it's free. It's free, which yes. is even better for our families. It's free, and you can do it. You know, if you're in a waiting room, you know, a lot of our right. our families are in waiting rooms for they feels like half your life. Um, right. I do have a son on the spectrum who's 21, and I remember those days where I just felt like you spend a lot of downtime. You could do it in the middle of the night or whatever. It's it's just it's a wonderful resource, and it's in 30 to 40 minute chunks. So you know, so you can do it over time, uh, and and it's a it's it designed to teach bus drivers and teachers and. You know, everyone who deals with someone with autism, uh, better strategies. And uh, Leandra, I think I would add if, if um, you know, if, if a service is what a family wants, um, you know, looking for somebody who's really going to listen to the your perspective and your priority. So, you know, a lot of autism intervention is well, it can be split. It's either directly oriented toward the child, especially our younger kids building skills for our older kids. Again, it's maybe skill building, but also maybe emotional regulation or social skills. But um, for our, our philosophy is that every one of those services is family centered and needs to have the parent participation because the kids are gonna do better to build those skills if all the people around them like also agree with those you know, skills and are there to support them and can be the coach out in all different kinds of um, situations. So the more people, so if you do engage in treatment, the more natural context you can get the service within, the more people that are around in the hub, you know, around that child, the better. So, you know, uh, teaching the coach, teaching the school team, you know, trying to get everybody kind of on the same page as to what you're trying to, to shoot for as a parent. Um, so we do something called behavioral consultation. Uh, there are behavior analysts out in the community that this is kind of their thing is to talk with families, figure out like ideas, strategies to help, you know, improve whatever is the situation that needs, you know, uh, or could it benefit from some improvement. And that can happen pretty individually and in the community. But you can also, we do something called Triple P, Positive Parenting Program. And it's a group context. So, so much what of what we love about that is the families together, talking about their experiences, sharing their ideas, learning strategies, trying them, and then talking about them and then knowing, okay, it doesn't always work or <laughs> like that needs to be tweaked or yes, it worked and it was so simple. And like, he, or hearing someone else and getting motivated by what they were able to, to try and achieve. So if there's a group um, learning opportunity, I also would um, suggest that. We also do group psychotherapy um, services too for our teenagers where there might be a mental health concerns as well. And I think sometimes parents um, might, that, like, they might get lost in the shuffle in those situations. So if a child really is having some crisis or some real mental health um, difficulties, you know, most services are really oriented toward the child, but the parents in the middle of all of that as well and really wanting to support and needing to support. So. Um, so looking, we have those kinds of services, but looking for that when you're, you know, when you're trying to find support, um, even in those circumstances, getting that, um, getting your needs met and your learning kind of fulfilled um, to support your child as well. Thank you everyone for sharing the resources and the information you share regarding supporting a parent and the wonderful advice. Some of the questions that we are receiving in our live chat are also geared towards um, individuals who are adults who are newly diagnosed with autism or parents who have been caring for their child and, and feel like they had more resources um, when their child was under 18 and now they're in an adulthood and may feel like they are kind of lost in the system on what programs and resources are out there for adults. Can you touch on that uh, for a moment? Well, one thing I would say, I think, I, I mean, I work at a children's hospital, so I'll be brief, um, but I do think connecting, like um, Kathy said early on with the County Board of, um, of DD, those are lifelong supports. And so those service coordinators can really help with that transition to adulthood. 
I think, um, and I'm talking about transition. So again, um, coming from a, a child orientation, but um, also in schools, there are thing, there are people called transition specialists who are there to help really make sure that the last years in um, in the in high school are oriented toward the next step for that student. Um, and then our um, opportunities for Ohioans with disabilities is another um, organization to know the name of OOD. And they're there to provide in adulthood, some, some transition age work, but in adulthood, those supports to help um, transition into employment and to really make employment a viable opportunity for more, for more autistic individuals who moving into adulthood. Well, and I think the, the, the area of services to adults, you, you know, the, the viewers are absolutely right. There is not as much out there for um, adults as for children. Uh, we uh, about 18 months ago we started an adult support group uh, for adults uh, on the spectrum uh, no parents involved no caregivers involved uh, it is and it, it has been uh, really fabulous to see uh, the the interaction the the support and the, the relationships you know it, it's been online or about to go live for our first meeting uh, next week uh, but there aren't as many of those opportunities out there. Um, my son uh, has benefited for years from Special Olympics. He has lots and lots of adult friends that he started with in Special Olympics. Um, and that, you know, now, now um, they go bike riding together. They, you know, you know, they plan outings to restaurants, whatever. So, you know, um, that base was built, um, you know, in 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 childhood and and growing up with these folks um but you know there are some other recreation programs out there uh as a as a way um to make connections i agree that it it has been somewhat lacking but there are people out there they're trying to address it and most groups that are dealing with disability community organizations that is part of their purview, so to speak. Um, here at Ocali, we have the Lifespan Transition Center. You can check that out online and that is their focus and employment. And they have a lot of information and research um, like I'm adding, but um, I've heard about organizations that are working on the um, residential aspect. Um, I, and so they're out there, um, again, persevere, um, Google, Google, um, but they, people are trying to address those issues. We actually have a gentleman on our board who wasn't diagnosed until age 58. Uh, and he has actually made online contacts all over the world um, with folks um, through the miracle of the internet, which I think has, has you know, um, been just a, a godsend for him. And I think another resource uh, that's definitely worth a mention um, in both Kathy's son and Gwen's son has taken part in, in part of these is um, NISONG or their aspirations program. Uh, the next chapter book club is fantastic as is their aspirations program. So I think that is a resource um, that people can tap into uh, that's been very helpful. They work on socialization, they work on life skills, dating, um, you know, just getting our um, adults again out into the community. So I just kind of wanted to also um, right. mention that resource as well. Thank you so much for sharing those resources. We definitely will have to get that information directly from you so we can post it out here to the community that we are serving. And I also want to take this time to thank you for sharing your personal journeys um, and being relatable to our audience and sharing how you have persevered and the tenacity that you have done. I have great admiration for the caregivers here on this call. Um, there are questions also in our chat regarding our Franklin County Human Healthy Human Resource Services um, agencies, they are servicing some of the parents that you're describing, and they, they would like to know what are the best ways that they can access these resources by hand to be able to give those parents um, that those resources. And keep in mind, these parents are also talking to some of our staff members where they're dealing
dealing with um, the survival crisis um, and maybe not coming into our offices necessarily to discuss the, the, the issues that are happening or circumstances that are happening with their home, but these are issues that are affecting um, their household. So being able to be that person that are, is caring for them and address that person holistically, what would be your best way to provide those resources for them? I think for us, if we, if, if um, both families or other providers or other um, agency representatives want to call our autism resource clinicians, that one of their main jobs is to connect people, whoever, with the resources that they need. And so they can kind of individually pull information, get phone numbers together, a list of camps, uh, social support groups, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I think probably each one of our agencies has something like that, you know, so that, um, and certainly you can use my contact information. I could get that to you. Um, 614-355-7570 is our phone number. And you would just call, ask for an autism resource clinician, and they could maybe help you get the resources that you need for the, the people you're supporting. But I think the other thing is, don't be afraid to call your service coordinator, um, your child's teacher, whatever, and, and talk to them. Um, they, you know, sometimes help is, is there, um, but you don't know, you, you don't ask for it. Um, and, you know, if you have, you know, a, a responsive service coordinator um, at, at Franklin County Board of DD, a lot of times they will, you know, fi find, you know, ways for you to, to navigate those systems. And most school districts have someone who is a parent mentor who's assigned to work with families that have children with disabilities. And they can be a wonderful resource. And Tamika, one other thought I had is that, you know, it sounded like you're, some of your team are, are providing that support to families. And I think just recognizing the complexity of, of the system that um, families of uh, individuals with autism are, are within. You know, there's so many different people that could be supportive. So all of us as professionals, like making sure we're collaborative, reaching out to each other, knowing what each other, uh, what our roles are, what we can or can't do, what we're not gonna be able to do. Um, and just trying to work as smoothly as a system as we can so the family's path is easier because I would say in talking with so many families, figuring out what that path is with agencies and services, and then like navigating like different perspectives or, you know, one group being able to do one thing or saying one thing was right and another group saying something else is right. So anyway, that, that sparked that thought in me as well. So for, for, for providers out there trying to provide support, us coming together a little bit better would be a good, a good mission. Thank you so very much. Uh, the one question I definitely want to ask, because I can say it touches me personally, as my son was also recently diagnosed with autism. Um, we have members of our community that have lived experiences with negativity, stares, and whispers from others um, they, that may not understand outbursts and behaviors of a loved one with autism. What would be your best suggestions to assist caregivers when we're out and about in the community, day-to-day -day tasks? how to manage questions and those reactions from others? You know, first of all, you, you never respond with anger um, because that just, that just makes the person defensive. Um, Autism Society for many years has, has um, distributed these little cards, wallet cards that, you know, you can just hand to someone and said, you know, my, you know, this person has autism, these are the, you know, the um, major components of autism, and these are ways that you can interact that will help you to interact positively. Um, I think just handing them a card like that or an explanation like that and walking away um, is, you know, is is the the best possible uh, approach because you know sometimes it embarrasses them and they realize they they you know, sort of stuck their nose into somebody's business that is not theirs. Um, yeah, it's, it's a tough problem. And I, you know, I think that's one of the reasons that autism acceptance and autism awareness are so important 
Um, you know, I, I heard my child, I would never have let my child act like that in public or, um, and you know, one gentleman, I was at the, the art festival downtown and I, my son was about eight and I was pulling him in a wagon and this man was just beside himself. He was in it probably in his sixties that, that I should have to pull this, you know, fully grown young, you know, strong, strong eight year old around. And, you know, and he was given telling me I shouldn't spoil him like that. And I looked at him and I said, you know, this is the only way I can be here because he has that space. You know, it took care of some of the sensory and anxiety uh, inducing, you know, parts of that experience for him. Uh, and he kind of looked taken aback and, and backed off. And I think that part of why our um, population is very isolated. Um, and I personally know uh, that especially when my son was younger and transitions were hard and it was hard to take him to the grocery store. And, and I did get horrific looks. And one time my older son said to me, you know, mom, why is our life so hard? And it just really struck me that, you know, he is noticing it too. And I just, of course, you know, got in my car and bawled my eyes out. <laughs> it is really hard. But I think like Kathy said, awareness, acceptance, we need to educate um, the community. We need to educate um, everyone around us um, that, you know, how to approach these individuals and, um, you know, how you can interact. And really the best way to do it is a smile, just eye contact, just smile you know, I see you. You're doing a great job, mom. I see what you're doing and I am here. You know, I, that is just, just really, really important. Um, cause you know, I think we, we've all, everyone in the community has, has had those feelings where it is really hard, but like Gwen said, we need to persevere. There is hope. We want to have our kids out in the community. So we just need to do it. We need to go out there. We need to educate. We need to, you know, we need to spread acceptance. We need to spread awareness, um, kind of go up with our heads held high and, and, and really uh, let people know, you know, we're, we're happy to be here. And, um, you know, we, we just need to be a little bit more accepting and, and kind. And, and, and we're, I'm sorry, we're one in 44. So we're yeah. everywhere. Yes. So <laughs> we need to teach people and it is amazing the biases that are out there, but this, this, program right here addresses it. I'll just tell you one little story that has been our experience. My son plays an instrument, he plays with a band and music is his safe place. So he is in his fullness. So he doesn't, he doesn't show some of the qualities of autism when he's in that space. And we're grateful for that. But, but, we, but we always acknowledge it. We always talk about autism. That's part of our, that's part of our, our goal, quite frankly. And it is not uncommon for someone, someone who's even connected to autism through their family, through their work, to say, why do you talk about autism? You can't tell he's autistic while he's on stage. Why do you talk about it? And I'm always, I'm always, I'm nice and I smile, like you said, but I'm always taken aback because what is the underlying message? Like you should be ashamed and you should keep it quiet. And we're, we're not going to do that, but it's not easy. And you're right, Jenny. I mean, everything in you wants to react emotionally, but that's not going to help. So, so, but that card that you guys offer, that's a wonderful tool to use. And that, you know, realize, realizing that this is, you know, one step in a long process. You know, I always remember going to um, the trick or treat at the zoo. And, and my, you know, they had free train rides and my son was about five and you know, or six and he loved trains and the line was just, you know, incredibly long. And my husband held him in his arms, shrieking and crying for an hour because we knew we had to teach him that waiting in line, he would get, ultimately he would get to that train. And people were looking at us. They couldn't believe we were allowing this kid to have this meltdown for that long. But he got on the train. He immediately brightened up. And the next time, we didn't have that meltdown because he knew the train was coming. So, you know, it didn't matter. You know, he was who mattered.
Thank you, oh, everyone. Yeah. We This has definitely been an important conversation. And unfortunately, we have run out of time <laughs> and haven't been able to address all that we wanted to be addressed. But it has been an honor um, listening to your stories uh, professionally and personally and being here. And I know that the families who are watching today and that we will be able to share this video with will definitely be encouraged, have provided resources and the willingness and the, what you're saying that hope and tenacity to be able to persevere and move forward. I wanna thank you, Kathy, Jackie, Jenny and Gwen for being here with us. Thank you, Leandra for facilitating this conversation and coordinating in this event. It has been great to hear from you. And again, thank you to our Board of Commissioners who, like you said, Jackie, is definitely um, always championing for our children um, and our Franklin County community. Uh, autism acceptance is about inclusion. And we wanna make sure here in the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion that we are putting inclusivity practices and information and awareness to the forefront. Because no matter who you are, what you have, we all have challenges. We all have to work through some things. And you definitely have made sure that we will be able to learn from um, your personal and professional experience on how we make sure we are practicing inclusivity in our environments. I am looking forward to receiving all of the information that you shared today. So we will be able to provide that to our Franklin County community and our residents as we continue to serve every resident every day. Thank you so much audience for joining us today uh, for our Autism Acceptance Awareness Month here in April. There are many, many things that are planned for this month for you to um, dive into autistic, Autism Acceptance Month, whether you are living that experience or not, the support is needed if you haven't recognized that today during this conversation. Have a great day, everyone, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.